Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We are live with you from 1 until 3 every weekday afternoon. Now, coming up this afternoon, Hamas terrorists have refused to release the youngest hostage, instead handing 10-month-old mo- Kafir Bibas to separate Palestine terror groups. Uh, Rishi Sunak uh, starts a diplomatic row with Greece after cancelling a meeting with the Greek Prime Minister over the future of the Elgin marble. And David Walliams gets an apology from Britain's Got Talent after derogatory comments he made while working on the show were leaked. All of that is coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Alex. Good afternoon. More hostages releases are expected later as the truce between Israel and Hamas enters its fifth day. At last minute deal meant the pause in the fighting has been extended by 48 hours. Under new conditions, three Palestinian prisoners will be released in return for each Israeli hostage. A court has heard two teenagers allegedly plotted to kill Brianna Jai. The 16-year-old girl, who was transgender, was found fatally injured in a Wiltshire park earlier this year. Both defendants deny murder. Talk TV correspondent Oliver Whitfield Mirjic has been following the case at Manchester Crown Court. The prosecution is continuing to set out its opening argument in which they accuse both of the defendants, Girl X and Boy Y, of plotting to murder Brianna Jai. They say that they found a planning document where there was going to be a code word which was said before both of the defendants were then going to stab Brianna in the stomach and in the back. In the day before the murder took place, Girl X is said to have messaged Boy Y that she was excited. Both of the defendants continue to deny that they played any part in the murder and continue to blame each other. A man's admitted to killing three people in separate attacks in Nottingham. School caretaker Ian Coates and students Barnaby Webber and Grace O'Malley Coomer were stabbed to death in June. Fado Callow Kane, also known as Adam Mendes, has denied murder but admitted to three counts of manslaughter on the basis of diminished responsibility. Michael Gove has said sorry to the victims and families who endured pain and loss during the pandemic. The then Duchy of Lancaster told the COVID inquiry the structure of the Cabinet Office was flawed and not appropriate to deal with the crisis. He said politicians are human beings who made mistakes and errors. But the way in which the Cabinet Office was configured was not, uh, to my mind, appropriate for the type of pandemic that we faced and indeed the type of crisis that requires an effective whole of government. After an anxious wait of more than two weeks, rescuers have broken through to the workers trapped in a collapsed tunnel in northern India. They finally reached them by breaking through the last of the rocks and gravel by hand. But the 41 men remain underground. Rescuers say it could take hours to pull them out one by one using a three foot wide pipe. And the granddaughter of the founder of Wilco says she's devastated for letting workers down. 12,000 redundancies took place after the retailer collapsed. Lisa Wilkinson, who's Wilco's chair, told MPs that they've let every one of those people down. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello, it's feeling cold out there for today and for the rest of the week due to northerly winds, but there's also plenty of sunshine to be had. Although it is a bit cloudy across parts of the southwest of England and Wales for this afternoon with one or two showers. Everywhere else it's mainly dry with plenty of sunshine, but the northeast of Scotland, as you can see, is seeing some showers that are turning wintry across the high ground there. It is going to be a cold feeling day compared to recently as well. Temperatures are up to around three to five or six degrees Celsius, slightly higher across the southwest. West. Now into tonight, it stays mostly clear and cold with a widespread frost developing again across parts of Scotland. Northern and eastern England may also see frosty conditions as well as Northern Ireland. Showers will continue across central and southeastern parts of England and there will be showers across the northeast of Scotland and northeast England and there could be icy stretches across these areas. There may also be some snow by the early hours of the morning down to some lower levels of Scotland and northeast England. Otherwise, it's a repeat performance for tomorrow. Plenty of sunshine on the cards. Once again, again, the far southwest of England and Wales, a bit cloudier and less cold, but uh, everywhere else, lots of sunshine. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. There is lots coming up over the next few hours, including a true David versus Goliath story of Charlie's Bar. That's right, a small pub in Northern Ireland which posted its 700 quid Christmas ad at the weekend, but it's since gone viral. And Rishi Sunak's woes continue. The Tories are slumping in the polls, and yet he has decided, in his infinite wisdom, to start a diplomatic fight with Greece. You love that story, don't you? It's your favourite story of the it, century. It is. I just, I just don't get it. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, if you want to ask a question of the day, we'll give you our proper question of the day. Uh, but I was thinking of asking you all to call us in. 0344 999 What memory. are the Elgin marbles? <laughs> I mean, how many people actually know? It's a middle class... I know, I know. Yeah, I know. I know. You do, uh, but uh, you're trapped in Westminster's middle-class bubble. Uh, I think most people don't know what they are. I think people know they were the marbles and grease. No, they don't! That's my whole point, over. Alex! Yes, they What do. can I do to break you out of the Westminster bubble? Hey, people don't know what the Elgin marbles I, I are. I you know, Mr Grew up in London. I'm the daughter of a lorry driver from Gloucester, just cos I like stuff <laughs> about ancient <laughs> Greece now. What's that? That's, that's what's that? Six me. degrees of separation. How do we get from the Elgin marbles to being a lorry driver's daughter well, in Gloucester? Slating my working <laughs> class merit. So yeah, I feel sort of Angela class Rayner. Merit. I feel like Angela you're Rayner about on a Class as David Cameron. Leave that hanging there. <laughs> I was just thinking, I don't know which is worse, being sort of accused of being a toff from Chipping Camden. I'm not or accusing North you of being a toff. I'm not accusing or, you of being a toff. Or being compared to that spade-faced buffoon okay, who lives I'm in gonna the I'm going to add to today's uh, uh, show question. What are the Elgin marbles and do you care? <laughs> uh, I mean, frankly, I could not care less <laughs> about the Elgin Are actually doing this? You're actually doing this Give us a call as uh, they just it. put this up on He's our screen. 0344 499 1000. Text us on 87222 or tweet us on on X at Talk TV. I do believe that our question is of the day. Seriously, if you want to call us, it is, uh, what was it? What, what should uh, Rishi do to win the next election? Or what are the Elgin marbles? We no, want it's not the Elgin no, do marbles. The, do the marbles. It's not the, the serious, marbles. seriously. Uh, he can, needs some marbles. He's losing oh his. God. Do the marbles. Uh, can Rishi Sunak still win the next election? And if so, how does he go about it? Well, oh, send him the Elgin oh, marbles God. back, obviously. 0344 <laughs> 499 1000. Or you can text us on 87222 or tweet us on X at Talk TV. I'll, I'll just throttle this guy here. Right. Carry All on. right, OK, well, <laughs> joining us the next hour, thank the Lord, to mediate everything, is Leona Morali, a former Conservative advisor. Leon, do you care about the Elgin marbles? Do you know what they are? I have to say, when I was a kid, I genuinely thought they were just like a bag of marbles. <laughs> uh, I, I had no clue of their cultural significance. And I have to say, I don't really care about this story a great deal. I'm not too bothered why Rishi Sunak made this his big point. But... Why has he? It's a very sort of... It's very odd, isn't it? Yeah. Of all the hills he could die on. <laughs> all we ever do with this guy is we look for him to show resolve, yeah. to be tough, and he never, ever, ever is. And suddenly, he's extremely rude to the Greek Prime Minister yeah. about the Elgin marbles. I mean, does it make him look tough or does it make him look like a wimp? Because yeah. a tough man would have gone in there and said, you might want the marbles back. But you can't have them. But you can't have them because we're yeah. keeping that bag of marbles here in, in the UK. <laughs> yeah. So he could have done that, but instead he didn't want the fight, he didn't want the argument. And all he's done is he's let Keir Starmer 
post all over his yeah. social media that he's been meeting with the Greek Prime Minister, so Starmer can be the international diplomat, while Rishi's hiding in his back room, crying over the Elgin marbles. So I don't get it. I don't think it it's... is really strange, isn't it? I mean, so you know, news out today is despite all of his multiple resets, mm. as they're being called, you know, sort of trimming the edge off a bit of tax, which mm. no one's going to really notice. Yeah. Failing pound, to do we're, anything we're, we're about anything pound else. Pound a day. Pound a day. Pound, it's, pound it's a sixth of oh, yeah, a pint exactly. of beer. One it's swig. It's not even a coffee from Pratt. It's, it's it? one it's swig even... of beer a day. That's what our, he's saying. Our units are alcohol always. <laughs> <laughs> always. always <laughs> we don't drink coffee. No, we don't. We don't do that. And what have you got in there, then? Well, uh, oh, look, a lot. <laughs> it's my 14th <laughs> cup of black coffee of the day. I do drink rather too much of it. But anyway, it's not working, mm -hmm. is it? Um, yeah. it? Everything he says and does, because mm -hmm. he's not doing the things in the right place. And you've got this constant fallout as well of, you know, James cleverly now saying, well, we shouldn't leave the ECHR. Cameron saying we shouldn't leave the ECHR. Everyone else saying we should leave the ECHR. Cleverly saying, well, you know, the Rwanda plan ain't that important, is it? And everyone going, well, you can't say that. This is our, like, pinnacle policy okay. that we're never going to deliver. I mean, it's just herding cats. Yeah, I don't think they know, Alex, exactly what their strategy is. And I think that comes from Sunak, not really knowing what politician he is. Is he a Brexiteer? Because he says he is, but he doesn't look like one. Oh, yeah. Is he a right winger? He says he is, but again, he doesn't sound and look like one. So I'm not entirely sure what Rishi Sunak is necessarily. And I don't think his government knows what they're doing. Because as you say, Rwanda's meant to be this sort of flagship policy. And when I was in uh, in Westminster advising these politicians, we had message discipline. You've all got to be saying the same thing over and over and over. James Cleverley's off freelancing, saying a different thing to the Prime yeah. Minister. Mm. A lot of the Cabinet are torn on this, and they don't look like a government with a plan, and that's a problem for him. And I'll tell you, if I was an advisor to Rishi, I would say, look, don't get involved in the Elgin Marbles debate, because the headlines tomorrow will be all about you losing your da -da marbles. <laughs> it's pretty obvious stuff. Uh, but on to our top story. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, do you know who else is freelancing and not saying what they're supposed to be saying? That's you and I, because we just decided to go straight into our second segment instead of doing our first. Uh, well, no, on to our top story. Well, Qatar is aiming eventually. to extend the Israel Hamas truce once again as the first day of the two day extension holds. It's as Hamas have admitted that the youngest hostage taken from Israel. He's only 10. Uh, is uh, Kafir Bibas and his family have been handed to a separate Palestinian terror group. The group is based in the southern city of Khan Yunis, which is expected to be the location of Israel's next offensive once the truce expires. Nine children, including three-year-olds, twin, three-year-old twins, and two women, were freed on Monday. Well, joining us now, live from Jerusalem, is Rachel Gurr, friend of the Shoham family, seven of whom were held hostage by Hamas, and six of whom have since been released. I mean, this... What what Hamas are essentially doing now, using a 10-month-old baby as a bargaining chip, surely the world should be waking up now to quite how awful this terrorist group are. I think the term is human shield. Uh, they're intentionally placing him uh, in the what is expected to be uh, the next battleground, where we know at the moment uh, Hamas is currently not just amassing, but you know laying booby traps, creating uh, the battleground. Uh, and they took him, it seems, not just because he was the youngest, but because of the international media attention. A little fear with his brother, uh, who's uh, two years old, and his mother. Uh, his 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 red hair set him apart and immediately made him a, a symbol and an icon uh, of the conflict, of the struggle. And therefore, the Hamas has decided to use him. Uh, it would seem as a human shield. Rachel, you're a friend of the Shoham family, uh, uh, through se several of whom have been released now. Uh, have you... Family. Uh, have you have you spoken to them? Uh, and uh, what are their stories? What are they telling you it was like down there? Uh, we can't we can't really say much of what uh, it was like for for security purposes. Obviously, we still have a both family members of this family and in general a, about two hundred hostages who are still a, in Gaza, a, whom we hope to rescue. A, it's a difficult story. We, we were talking about eleven family members, of which uh, three were murdered by Hamas a, on October seventh. Uh, and another seven were kidnapped, uh, including women and small children. The youngest is a little three-year-old uh, with the cutest blonde curls. Uh, the oldest is her grandmother. Uh, and six out of the seven uh, were released uh, two days ago. The children's father uh, remains captive uh, in Gaza. Uh, and when they came back, they discovered that their father, grandfather, husband uh, had been murdered by the Hamas. 
uh, as well as the grandmother's uh, sister uh, and brother-in-law. So they are so happy to be together again. Uh, my friend is nine months pregnant and it was, you know, her dream that her mother and her sister would be with her uh, as she gave, as she gives birth uh, over the next few days. Uh, but it's very bittersweet. They're coming back to find that their family uh, members were murdered. Their house uh, was burned to the ground. Um, my friend's family, Haran, are among the founders of Kibbutz Be'eri, which is one of the hardest hits kibbutzim. Uh, her grandparents were among the founders, and she is essentially her children the fourth generation uh, to grow up there. And so they have lost both their homes and their families uh, and their community to a large extent. And so it, it's, it is wonderful to see them back, but it is very bittersweet. I think what is so startling about the atrocities committed on the 7th of October is these aren't political prisoners. These aren't what you might consider to be normal hostages in a war or a conflict, but civilians targeted and targeted from communities that I, I believe are sort of a lot more open-minded and sympathetic towards Palestine and a two-state solution than maybe some of the mainstream media let on uh, the views of uh, the, the majority of average Israelis. What do you think motivated Hamas and, and the associated terrorist organization to target mothers and daughters and babies uh, from very ordinary families who essentially are extremely peaceful people? I think it was just proximity. Uh, Hamas has, has said over and over again, both before October 7th and since, that it is their expressed goal uh, to murder every single Israeli. They, they also don't differentiate between Jews uh, and Arabs. We, we saw them murder uh, Israeli Arabs as well, both Muslims and Christians, as well as Druze. Uh, and people, uh, members of the Bedouin community on October 7th, there's also a Bedouin family uh, that was taken hostage, including uh, their three teenage children. Uh, and Hamas's aim is to murder to you know, rape, kill, pillage, murder everyone. Uh, and the they specifically spoke, chose these communities because they are the closest to the border. They were the first they could get to. They got as far as they could. They made it to the central cities uh, of Ofakim and Sterot, uh, which are quite away from there. So they simply burned and maimed their way as far as they could. Uh, Rachel, uh, there are many calls for this uh, truce, ceasefire, humanitarian pause uh, to continue. Uh, Joe Biden, we know, is putting pressure on Netanyahu uh, to keep this situation going. Uh, but I detect that the resolve of the Israeli people is to carry on uh, and that there will be a, uh, a resolution of, uh, of hostilities. Uh, what do you think is going to happen in the next couple of days? Do you think this truce will end? And what do you want to happen? Well, I want to have all the hostages back. And so long as uh, Hamas produces uh, the hostages, you know we will not, uh, uh, you know we will not uh, reinstate uh, hostilities. Uh, but there's no question that the Hamas has stated very explicitly, uh, even post at least three or four times in public interviews post October seventh, that it is their uh, commitment to their intention to perpetrate the atrocities that they perpetrated on October 7th again and again and again. I believe their words were two, three, four, five, as many times as possible. And it is our commitment, uh, both to the hostages that have been brought back and to those who were murdered, that this will never, ever happen to them again. And do you, and anticip order... do you anticipate, Rachel, a return to hostilities? Definitely. There's no question about it. Uh, we can no longer suffer Hamas uh, as our neighbor. Uh, it's important to say that our, our greatest sympathies are with the Palestinian people, with the people of Gaza, who are suffering enormously uh, from the, the travesty and the horrors that Hamas has wrought. Uh, but Hamas cannot be allowed to terrorize, not us and not them anymore. There simply there isn't, there isn't place for such brutality and inhumanity uh, in our world. Yeah, Rachel, thank you ever so much uh, for talking so candidly and taking the time to be with us uh, today. I, I mean, uh, Leon, do you think that the Western world is behaving differently towards Hamas than they have done other terrorist organisations? We can see very clearly with the nature of the hostages taken, the using of a 10-month-old baby held by some other gang or terrorist organization, not even by Hamas itself. And they're saying, oh, well, it's down in Khan Yunus. You can't bomb there because this is where the baby is. I mean, this is utterly appalling. And yet, despite how much people who have seen the videos that Israel have shown mm. 
a select number of journalists and so on and so forth say what they saw was some of the most blood-curdling, horrible footage that they've experienced in their life. Somehow, the Western world seems to not be regarding Hamas as ISIS, mm. but thinking almost that they're worth negotiating with. Yeah, it's bizarre, isn't it? And very much a case of double standards at play, I think, Alex, as you point out. And I think hearing Rachel's testament there is a stark reminder of the human cost of this conflict. And we can talk about diplomacy, we can talk about the international politics, but ultimately, these are people, these are families being ripped apart by horrific violence that we can't even imagine. And I think that can't be lost in this debate here. Hamas are a terrorist organisation by every single measure. And I think it's wrong that the West are not treating them in that way. Or even like Russia, when they invaded Ukraine, there is clearly an aggressor here, and that aggressor is Hamas. Now, I'm not necessarily justifying Israel's response and saying it's proportionate. I think, you know, there is obviously terrible violence on both sides. But Hamas are without doubt a terrorist organisation. They aren't held to account in the way that a nation state such as Israel is. And I think that comes with a bunch of different uh, considerations for the West to take into account. And surely, uh, if they don't release all the hostages, I mean, there's no chance of any kind of cease ceasefire. I mean, Israel and uh, especially Netanyahu have a lot of rhetoric tied up in this. Mm. Uh, and actually, when people step back in horror and say, look what Israel's doing, it's so terrible. What are they doing that they didn't say they were going to do? Mm. They're doing exactly what they said they were going to yeah, do. Yeah, they are, Kevin. I think that's part of the reason why you know, Israel are taking this response, because they've taken... There's still hundreds of hostages left that aren't going to be released. Exactly. And I think until that release happens, Israel are well within their rights to continue to defend themselves. And I think if that same thing happened in this country or in the United States or in Europe, I think we would all be rallied around that country saying, of course, you need to get back mm -hmm. your citizens that were kidnapped, brutally being tortured, murdered, raped in some instances. So I think that's only the right thing. But I can't see, as, as Rachel can either, I can't see hostility not being resumed because mm -hmm. they aren't being released in full. Sure. I mean, there has been Western intervention in other countries in the neighbourhood for terrorist attacks, for threats to allies and so on and so forth. In theory, America should be standing shoulder to shoulder with Israel. Mm -hmm. Of course, they've sent a few big warships um, to the coast, which I think is doing its best to hold Iran at bay. What should Britain's involvement be in this? A sort of junior party to America, just watching and observing, should we be doing more. Well, I'm not going to advocate, Alex, that we should be putting boots on the ground or, or intervening militarily in any way whatsoever. I don't think it's our war to fight necessarily at this point. Mm. I do think, however, we need to stand by Israel diplomatically. They are an important ally for the UK and the entire Western world. When you consider how strategically important Israel is as a country and you consider the historical context as well, the persecution of, of Jewish people throughout history, I think the UK has to stand by them. So I think throwing our diplomatic heft behind them unequivocally has to happen. And I was impressed, David Cameron making it, uh, you know, one of his first sort of ports of call, making it one of his first statements, being on Israel. I think that's important and we have to continue that. Well said. Well, coming up after the break, we'll be discussing all of today's top stories, including the future looking blitty, pretty bleak for one Rishi Sunak as a new poll shows Labour's lead has extended to 20 points. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. 
Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas it possible a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Well, still with us in the studio, somehow he hasn't run away yet, uh, former Conservative advisor Leon Emerali, who's going to be joining us for a roundup of all the top stories of the day. Now, we're going to kick off with Sunak and his scrambling to, I don't know, somehow restore uh, some of that lost vote share, which he doesn't seem to be doing very well. Now, you know him a little bit, don't you? Because he's worked for Barclay when he was in the Treasury. He's an old drinking mate of yours, isn't he? Well, <laughs> he's a few pints, you and old Richard. total, of course, Richard Sunak. <laughs> uh, and I have to confess, I don't know him terribly well, but, you know, I do think that he is someone who is a very smart guy. I yeah, think no doubt about that. He's I very agree. methodical, but perhaps too methodical is what a lot of people are saying. I mean, he's the type of bloke that if you wrapped your car around a lamppost, he'd still be checking the tyre pressures to make sure that's all right. And I think <laughs> yeah. at some point, as Prime Minister, you need to have a strategy rather than being sort of wrapped up in all of the details. And I think that might be one of his downfalls. And uh, so this is after his... Uh, I mean, I've lost count of how many great resets he's had over the last two months. But uh, I was saying earlier, uh, you know, I think he's a bright guy, mm. uh, but I d really don't think he's a very good politician. Mm. And to keep styling the Tories as the party of change, the party of freshness, is a bit ridiculous after 13 years. Uh, he should have come up with a different strategy, I think, but uh, it is what it is. He keep, keeps calling it us the party of change and look where it's ended him up. He is 20 points behind the Labour Party. His strategies aren't working, are they? No, they're not, Kevin. They're absolutely not working at all. And I think normally when you're in government for this long, you pitch yourself as the party actually that's got a strong track record in government. If you're the opposition, you can say you're the party of change. Yeah. But when you're in, you need to be talking about the great things you've done over the past yes. 13 years. And I don't think either they, <laughs> either they haven't done anything or they're not able to talk about it. And I do think that they need to start pointing to some of those successes. Now, it is very difficult, because let's not forget, we've had most of the time wrapped up either in Brexit, most of the time then wrapped up in COVID. There hasn't been a lot of time to actually start implementing an agenda. But that said, they do need to start spinning this narrative that actually the country is in the right direction. Whether or not people believe it is another matter because they look at their bank statements at the end of the month, they look in their wallets at the end of the month and think, I've got less money than I did you know, this time maybe 10, 15 years ago. So that isn't good for the government and they need that to change. Do you think the problem as well with Sunak is his leadership style? He's not exactly the greatest orator. I always feel like he's trying to sell me a vacuum cleaner on a shopping <laughs> channel or something. That he, he doesn't really have that sort of authenticity and that sort of power of persuasion that, mm. well, I don't think many of his predecessors have had it necessarily, but Boris was a great communicator. Mm. Um, 
Um, maybe that's why he dodged a meeting with the, the Greek Prime Minister when yeah. he was saying, give us our marbles back. Possibly. And, you know, I always use my mum and dad as a good focus group for politics. And my dad says that Rishi looks like a little boy. And I think that's part of the problem. He doesn't look like a strong leader. Can you imagine Rishi round the table with Putin, with Xi Jinping of China, with all the other world leaders, and looking them in the eye and standing up for Britain's interests? You just can't really see it. And I think that's part of, as you say, the communication. He sounds like a, a CBeebies presenter, really, doesn't he? That's mm -hmm. a sort of high-pitched tone and excitement at all times. And he needs to find a way of communicating that differently. And, Hi, guys, come on. You know, I'm being reasonable here. Come on, support me. He, th he thinks that by being reasonable, he'll ga garner support, but he just won't. Uh, and some would say he isn't all that reasonable. And I don't think he was particularly reasonable to the Greek leader, Kyrgios uh, Mitsotakis, uh, who he cancelled a meeting with at uh, Downing Street over the Elgin Marbles. He said it's a respect thing mm -hmm. because the Greek leader, understandably, is sure, refusing to... <laughs> change Greece's position on the marbles. We want them back. Uh, it seems, uh, as I was saying earlier, Leon, very strange thing to die on a hill about. It, Nobody really cares. No one really cares. It's not a vote winner. I don't think anyone's going to yeah. be looking at the papers thinking, oh, good for Sunak, he's standing up for yeah. the, the Elgin yeah. marbles. I don't think that's going to change exactly the dial. Exactly right. He is picking the wrong fight here, because Greece are an important ally. Right. I mean, they're, they're a NATO ally at a time we've just spoken about conflicts around the world, an important ally, and we need them to be on side. It doesn't feel right that you'd pick Greece as the one sort of example of a country that we should have a fight with when they're actually an important ally, especially for things like immigration as well, where, you know, close to Albania, where there's a lot of yeah. Im immigration mm -hmm. coming into this country illegally, they could really be a strong partner. And if we're just souring our relationships with Greece, to what end? I don't get it. Yeah. No. Uh, I mean, another thing that I don't seem to get is this COVID inquiry rumbling along tediously until 2026 in this country. And it was uh, Michael Gove's turn today. 2030. Um, to 2030, till, yeah. till the end of time. No, 26 is only when the module's in. Then there's four years of deliberation. It goes, oh. on, for, it goes on for about eight years, at least. How old am I going to be? I don't even want to it think should, about it. It should, by then, have cost about three Gosh, quarters. you'll May be retired. <laughs> <laughs> you well, won't have to so. talk about it anymore. Actually, I'm be... thinking of retiring today. Uh, but seriously, it, I mean, this could... This could rumble on uh, for many years and, and probably, I'm not kidding, will probably cost a billion pounds. Yeah. It's obscene, it's grotesque. Crazy, crazy money. And, you know, are we learning anything no. from this that we didn't already know? I don't they think they swear we are. a bit. They swear a bit. And the, the best bit, of, the most important bit so far, they've got the most coverage, have been the entertaining bits. Right. You know, yes, the, of course. The Dominic Cummings text messages and the slagging off going on behind closed doors. That's not what it should be I about. I think one thing we have learned, though, which has sort of caught my eye, is I remember in the early stage of this pandemic when people sort of speculated about the virus not coming from a wet market, but coming out of that virology lab, and essentially everyone shutting down anyone who thought that, calling them tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists and pretty mad. Mm. Well, it turns out, actually, we were probably right. Let's have a listen to Michael Gove telling this to the inquiry. We were not as well prepared as we uh, should have been, ideally. I think that is true. Um, uh, again, uh, it's in the nature of the fact that um, the virus was novel. Um, and, and indeed, I think, so. this probably goes beyond the remit of the inquiry, um, there is a significant body of, uh, uh, of judgment uh, that believes that the, the virus itself was man-made. I think what a lot of people hearing that might think is, mm. We are constantly, it seems, lied to or shut down or told we can't speculate on things and we're all mad for having suspicions about stuff. And it turns out we're right. I mean, that's not a great look, is it, for, for global governance, if you will? Yeah, I think uh, at the time when it came across, Alex, we weren't sure, where's this thing come from? You know, is it man-made, is it natural, whatever? We, we weren't sure. So I think at that point, it was OK to have those discussions about, well, perhaps it did come from the Wuhan uh, lab that, that of virology which was obviously close to ground zero, as it were. And I remember Donald Trump was one of the first to say, perhaps it was man-made. And actually, that got redacted, pretty much, from social media. He was de-amplified with those types of posts from on, on Twitter at the time. And I do think that we do need to learn lessons about free speech and actually encouraging different points of view that may differ from the status quo. We need that challenge to government and scientists. And as we saw throughout the COVID pandemic, the science has changed a lot. At the very beginning, we were told that it was uh, ventilators that were good for you. And now that turned out that they were no good in COVID. Then we heard about masks not being any good. And then five minutes later, we were told to wear masks. And I think that's part of the problem here. And it's eroded trust mm. in these so-called experts mm. because so much that they said and they presented to, to the public as fact 
turned out actually to be slightly more nuanced than that. Uh, these barristers at the Bo COVID inquiry, they're not quite getting it, if you ask me. They think they're in court adversarial. No, no. So you did call him a nasty <laughs> name. It says here, and what, you know, nobody cares. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Uh, but uh, let's move on to Joe Biden, uh, Leon. Joe uh, Biden. He ha is concerned about Britain's Rwanda policy uh, and uh, feels it could hurt the Northern Ireland peace process. Uh, my view on that is uh, what's it got to do with you? Mm, I agree with you, although I don't think the Rwanda policy is a good policy, but I do agree with uh, with you there, Kevin. Why is Joan Biden in, in interrupting effectively our own mm, yeah. uh, domestic policies? We don't do the same to mm. America. And I think we've seen this throughout the years, actually, with the US trying to show their influence on the UK. We saw it with Barack Obama during the Brexit debate, saying we'd be at the back of the queue for a trade deal. We're seeing it now with Joe Biden trying to step up for Ireland at every given point, just, to show, Irish thing just to show that he's Irish, to yeah. appeal to the Irish Americans. And I think it's him playing politics in the US. He's got an election to contend with uh, uh, next year as well. So he's trying to shore up his own position. And I think, actually, again, it's not good diplomacy. But it seems to be a sort of um, a, a Democrat problem in America, doesn't it? Mm. Most people on the Republican side appreciate the so-called special relationship and that we are natural bedfellows in the wider world. And yet there is something about the Democrats in America which wants to cleave away from Britain somehow, mm. as if we're shameful, as if we're a reminder of some dark past. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right, Alex, that there is this sense, certainly on the left of American politics, and let's not forget, it's got more left-wing in America than it's ever been, I think. You know, it used to be that the Republicans and Democrats were broadly centre-right and the Republicans more to the right. But actually, the Democrats now are very far left and they do see the UK as not this sort of natural partner to them. But we've got so much in common. The UK... Brit uh, the US UK partnership is hugely important, not just for us, but for the entire world in yeah. terms of stability. And I think we have to preserve it. It's a special relationship. We look to them for guidance and advice, uh, and they don't know where we are on the uh, map. Uh, <laughs> but there you are. Uh, let's talk about the migrants. Uh, mm. Eight more small boats uh, with, full of migrants wrapped in red blankets arrived in Dover yesterday. 364 no less, arrived on Sunday alone. Uh, we've now gone over the 28,000 mark. Uh, Michael Gove actually says that the migrant crisis is now putting significant pressure on the housing market. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's James Cleverly, the Home Secretary, speaking in the House of Commons uh, yesterday about the crisis. We have seized engines, we are breaking the business model, and we will continue to drive down those illegal uh, crossing, uh, uh, those illegal small boat crossings until we have stopped the boats. Oh, I mean, it's just constantly gaslighting, isn't it? Because any sort of move that they could make that should have a sensible impact, uh, they're not doing. There's a sort of real lily-liveredness about tackling this problem. Why do you think that is? Is that just to down to grandstanding in the international community and not wanting to be seen as the bad guys? Is it because legally they can't do anything? Are they in a bind, in a straitjacket, if you will, to act? Yeah, I think it's both of those things, Alex. I think it is very difficult legally for them to do a great deal to stop this because they do have obligations under international law to... Uh, illegal migrants coming into the country. But also, I think it's because the government have run out of ideas, frankly. And I think you can say the three words, stop the boats, as much as you yeah. want. It isn't going to happen unless you take action yeah. to actually yeah. do that. And I think Cleverly's right. I mean, we do have to break up the gangs. That is the sort of core of this. You have to break up the gangs to stop them smuggling these people overseas. But there's a lot of ways you can do that that the government simply just seem to be forgetting and ignoring. And I do think there is an element of, you know, international law potentially hamstringing them with actually being able to have any impact. Mm. Rishi should change his slogan to spot the boat. <laughs> you can see them every day coming over from uh, Calais. Uh, yeah, as I said earlier, Michael Gove uh, said to Times Radio yesterday that the migrant crisis was now putting significant, unsustainable pressure on Britain's housing market. Let's have a listen to Mr Gove. It is the case that uh, the migratory flows put more pressure on housing, but we haven't built enough homes overall for generations. This government is going to hit its target of a million new homes in this parliament. Do you recognise that as a problem, Leo? Well, look, is he talking about illegal migration or, or, or right. normal migration? <laughs> Good because point. I, I think that that's the question. And I think illegal migration has to has to stop. I mean, it's illegal, it's in the name. It has to stop and people's livelihoods are being ruined as a result of it. I think migration in its normal circumstance, in my view, isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it has to be controlled. And I say that as the grandson of immigrants who did come to this country in search of a better life, and thankfully they got it. And, and you know, I'm very grateful to 
the UK for that opportunity. But I do think that we have to control immigration to a point where our infrastructure can keep up with it. Because immigrants are good for the economy, but it's then suddenly not so good on public services. If you haven't got doctor's spaces, you haven't got housing, you haven't got school places, and I think we have to find that balance. Now, are we giving Sunak a hard time over this? Because I heard someone saying the other day that this is essentially a hangover of Boris Johnson, the legislation he put into effect as Prime Minister, and the numbers are from basically the outcomes of that rather than wish he hasn't been able to do anything about it yet. Is that fair? I think it might be a little bit fair. There's certainly some truth. And I think, actually, Rishi Sunak is more right-wing at, at his core than Boris Johnson ever was. It's mm. just the perception of it doesn't seem to be that way. And I do think Boris was quite liberal when it came to immigration. He wasn't necessarily this sort of big, tough guy when it came to and things like that. And green policies. And green policies, yeah. indeed. Maniac for green mm. policies. Yeah, and, and whether that came from him or whether that came from... from I think Gary, we know where that came from. I don't know, we? but, you know, certainly he, he, he was this kind of cuddly liberal, even though you wouldn't necessarily yeah. think it. So maybe, I think there may be some truth in that. Mm. Interesting. Uh, we have uh, your texts and tweets coming in at this lunchtime all about Rishi Sunak <laughs> and his marble rail. Hey! There you go. You were right, I was wrong, <laughs> I, know, I think you might be right. <laughs> Alison says... Oh, no, wait a minute, Alison's going to back me up. Alison says, I couldn't care less about the marbles or Sunak. These things don't matter to most normal working people who just want to live a quiet life, not have to constantly struggle. Instead, we have to put up with the country being destroyed by the incompetence of politicians and civil servants not doing their jobs, never mind an unelected prime minister. Fabrice thinks this issue with the Elgin marbles makes me think Sunak is trying to hide bad news behind a manufactured diplomatic <laughs> row. Otherwise, he's even more stupid than I first believed. Now, John jokes, let's give the marbles back. Why not? It seems like every institution has already lost theirs. <laughs> and Sarah reckons the Conservatives don't have a hope. They've had 13 years to sort out our problems, and right now they have the weakest prime minister in years. Well, not when it comes to those marbles. Yeah. Coming up after the break, more of today's top stories, including tensions rise within the royal family as more lines are released from biographer Omid Scobie's new book. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV. TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. <laughs> Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> if you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> yeah. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not Conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? 
If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillip. And this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Uh, let's have a look at a few more stories now leading today's papers uh, with former Conservative advisor Leon Emirali, uh, who is still here with us. Uh, now, this one caught our eye, Leon. I think you're going to like this one. Uh, the BBC, uh, obviously under fire for being somewhat pro-Palestine uh, <laughs> due to its various mistakes in reporting uh, the Middle Eastern crisis, the Gaza war. Uh, all of its mistakes are in the direction of Palestine and away from Israel. Funny that, oh, yeah. isn't it? Uh, but uh, BBC BBC staff now, apparently, you know that programme, Have I Got News For You. It's been on since 1548, 500 <laughs> long years of broadcasting. Uh, the two hosts, uh, Paul Merton and uh, uh, Hislop, Ian Hislop, are both 98 years old. They've been there forever. Anyway, uh, they have rolling hosts, a different host every week. And this week's uh, guest host, Guz Khan, has left BBC staff apparently lost for words, uh, because he spent the last few weeks calling Israel genocidal, accusing it of war crimes and of occupying Palestinian, I Palestine illegally. Uh, I mean, it sends a message, doesn't it? It's crazy. And I have to say, have I got news for you? Stop being funny about five years ago, I think. Well, you're being generous. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to enjoy it. 25 but, years but not ago. so much anymore. And, and I think this is just really bad judgment from isn't the BBC. It, it? I mean... Not now. Surely not in the middle of this, of right. this conflict. You but choose someone who holds those views. you think they're deliberately trying to send this message? I well, think they're deliberately think trying to say, to you start... tell us we can't be pro-Palestine, well, we can. I think you've got to start adding this up, don't you? One thing that shocked me even more, believe it or not, is when you have these journalists from the BBC in London who've sent a letter to Al Jazeera, but they don't want to identify themselves because, you know, they're, they're fearful that there may be reprisals, mm. saying how they're really concerned that the BBC are not humanising the victims in Gaza, and they're saying everything on Israel's side. What is going on? Yeah, I don't get it. It's so one-sided with the BBC, and it has been since the very beginning of this conflict. The whole row over Jeremy Bowen and his reports not being accurate, the row over refusing to refer to Hamas as terrorists. I just think that the mm. BBC, it is looking like, Kev, as you say, Maybe they have got an agenda, and I hope not, because I do believe the BBC is a good institution. Well, they're, 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 I think they're deliberate. They're like mm. kids. They just think that you, you criticise us, we dig our heels, and you can't tell us what to do. And I think that is exactly mm. what is going on here. The BBC is becoming so weird, mm. it's uh, beyond you know, belief. One thing that really gets my goat about the BBC is whenever they're talking about anything going on in the Middle East, they all put on a weird Arabic accent. They all say, <laughs> Dolomon, Hamas. Uh, well, all of them, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, let's move on to the big story of the day. And I, I do think this is a serious story. Uh, David Williams used to be a judge on Britain's Got Talent, the popular talent show on ITV. He was forced out a year or so ago uh, over remarks that he made about contestants that were pretty disgusting, actually. Uh, and they were recorded. He didn't realise they were recorded. Somehow or other, they got leaked and he had to leave the show. So instead of him being in trouble, he sued Britain's Got Talent uh, for £10 million damages, saying you shouldn't have released that private information about me. Uh, but he hasn't got £10 million, but he has uh, £10 million, but he's ended up with £1 million. Why? He should be giving them £1 million. He's the <laughs> one who committed the crime. Yeah, well, I do think, actually, his reputation since this was leaked has gone really down the gutter. Mm. So maybe there is a case that his reputation's been been damaged by it. But, is he, sure. but he deserves it, Leon. Did you hear what he said? Well, I did, and it was it was disgusting. And I suppose, you know, he's, his argument will be, well, it's behind closed doors, I can say what I want behind closed doors. Ooh. Now, 
To an extent, I, I agree with that. However, if you are in the public eye in the way that David Williams was, mm. if you're working with these people ultimately, it'd be yeah. like me going next door and calling you two all sorts of names yeah. under the sun. Or, or, it's or not here, right. to I saying it think, here yeah. on air. Yeah. I, I think this is yet another reason to leave the ECHR because he'll be using... <laughs> no, genuinely, it is from the ECHR that he'll be arguing for right to privacy as a private individual about these remarks being publicised. There you go, yeah, But James, Alex, let me really challenge you on that. Your pipe. Isn't that. Isn't that a good thing of the ECHR that we have got a right no, to privacy? No, 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 it isn't. Is it no, it no, isn't. Let's, don't, let's don't move on to Omid Scobie's book. We are not praising the ECHR on this show. Uh, yeah, Omid Scobie, uh, his new book and game uh, is causing real ructions. Royal feathers are flying. Uh, uh, it's all sorts of problems. Uh, basically, uh, the New York Times mm. uh, said that the Critique, uh, its review said it was like a press release cooked up by chat G. <laughs> PT. So uh, they're saying it's not particularly well written, but some of the revelations are very hurtful to the royal family. They are. And you know what I can't believe? Omid Scobie, he looks about 15 years old. He's 42. No! He's 42. I looked it up before I came here. Can you believe that? But I do think that him being used as this sort of mouthpiece for, uh, for Meghan and Harry, it isn't going down well with the royals. And Again, it's the same type of rehash stuff we've it's all heard. It's very before. rehashed. Yeah. And it's just like a great big soap opera at the but, minute. But the thing is, the things that he's rehashing aren't even accurate. And if he had just been on Wikipedia, he could have got a lot more sort of accuracy and no, detail no, than no. in his book. Alex. He got things like the time of the Queen's death announcement wrong, the date of her funeral wrong. Use Google, my you friends. Never, you never let the facts get in the way of a good story. First rule <laughs> of journalism. Well, uh, but to... look, talking of facts, uh, here's Piers Morgan uh, calling Scobie out on a complete lion inaccuracy. I got a copy of the book today and I just checked, as you do, it's a digital copy. I did a little search, up I come three or four times. And on one occasion he states, as a fact, that I have regular phone conversations with Queen Camilla. For the record, I have never had a single phone conversation with Queen Camilla. Now, he says, as a fact, in his book, that we have regular phone conversations. That I know, personally know, is an absolute lie. Interesting. Mm, yeah, Interesting. it is. It is. Yeah. He can't get out of that, can he, Scobie? No, he can't. And he's, you hear it here from the horse's mouth, as Piers saying he's never had a call with her. Well, why is it in the book, then? It is just the case he's making these things up to get headlines, to get clicks. But what's his motivation? Does it, why has I he mean... got some sort of... Well, no, apart from money, <laughs> but has he just you got some it, sort of really strange, bitter obsession with destroying the royal family? But, you know, there's some... I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's as lofty as that, Alex. I think, I think he's in it for the fame, partly. I think, you know, he, who is this guy? And now suddenly he's become a, a, yeah. a name because of his, his role in, in the royal family. Um, as you say, Kevin, money. I'm sure he's doing it for that reason. Because actually, Harry and Meghan say they haven't briefed him for this book. Uh, mm. So they're saying they haven't briefed him. Piers is saying what's, what, uh, it's all a load of rubbish. So mm. maybe we shouldn't even give it worth it. I'll give some worth credit it. on this. Uh, 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 or... I don't think... Uh, I think that he's still in contact with Harry and Meghan, but you read this mm. book, th this is not inside information, most of it. Most of it is a rehash of everything we've read. So I'm wondering uh, just how close he is to Harry and Meghan. He's always depicted as their sort of loyal mouthpiece. I think, I think, he's, a I think he's a lot less than that. I think he is as well. I do think he is. I mean, how close can you be without that being... Uh, a known fact that he is friends with them. I don't think that is the case. But there, there was one story that that, uh, that I read in there that was a bit heartbreaking, which was when the Queen died and Harry wasn't being contacted by the family, apparently, and he had to come over and he had to charter a flight from Luton up to Scotland to, to go and see her and he was kept in the dark. If that's true, that's sad. Important to stress, though, what, that is the one story that William is absolutely seethingly furious about mm. because he's been depicted as a guy who cut his brother out of the action, wouldn't take his phone call, and William apparently is telling everyone abso absolutely not true. Mm. And I'll tell you something else that isn't true. Uh, it isn't true uh, that uh, Captain Tom's legacy hasn't been ruined by his daughter, mm. Hannah Ingram Moore. Uh, she's in big trouble about his foundation. We know uh, mm. that story. And now she is admitted to pocketing £18,000 to judge an awards show. It was hosted by uh, Virgin Media. And uh, her hero, Father's Foundation, got just two grand of that. Uh, she's admitted to that. Uh, now, a lot of people said, oh, Virgin Media, why were they paying so much for her to make this award? Because they're being generous mm. to a charity. Mm. They mm. thought, well, we'll pay her over the odds because it's going to the Captain Tom Foundation. It didn't. It went into her skyrocket. It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. And I think her behaviour over the last year or two when this has started to come out has just really shone a light on how 
low huma humanity can be, because I do think she's really using and abusing the name of her father, who was a hero during lockdown. A lot of people yes, took inspiration was, from him. Uh, and, and now, you know, that's been left completely tarnished because of the actions of, of her. And we talk about being motivated by money. Well, I don't think there's anyone <laughs> on, 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 yeah, in the country point. more yeah, motivated yeah, than yeah. money than, than Hannah Ingram Moore. So I, I do think, you know, she really has, uh, should be ashamed of herself, frankly, with her actions. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of a string of um, successive things that she's done. There was the whole argument over building the spa, which yeah. was supposed to be used to... The ugliest spa ever built. Uh, yeah, what was it? Some <laughs> rehabilitation <laughs> centre. It's basically it was her hideous. own swimming pool, it isn't hideous. it? Like a village hall, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, really disgusting. Anyway, they've got to pull that down. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, what she's done, what her family have done, uh, they've, they, they've spoiled the legacy of Captain Tom, and that's a tragedy. Yeah, I have to admit, when... when Poor Tom, Captain Tom, was walking the garden. I do think something's a bit fishy here. Why is he doing this? What's happening? And, you know, it was clearly them saying, go on, keep going, get the media around, and we'll make a big thing of it, and then eventually we can make money from it. And she, she's... she's yeah, I looked at her website uh, recently. She's a life coach. Anyone oh, who describes no. themselves That's as a life a coach, job, I it? think you know, is, uh, is, yeah. is not onto a good thing. Definitely a non job. Uh, Leon, thank you ever so much. It's been delightful having you join really us. Really good, Leon. Thank you, you so much. Back. Leon Emerali there, former Tory advisor. Hey. Now, you've been texting and tweeting us about Rishi Sunak's future this lunchtime. Stephanie says Sunak, unelected, unlikable, <laughs> and unlike Zelensky, he would have to take a flight out of here rather than stay and fight for our country. I can't wait to vote him and his crone is out. We need saving. <laughs> and Dave says, what should Rishi do to win the next election? Control all immigration and stop the boats. Mass immigration, legal and illegal, is a self-perpetuating phenomenon which will continue unless tough and difficult decisions are taken to break the cycle. Uh, the more people that arrive, the more demand is created on health, education, housing and the rest. Wow, indeed. Couldn't agree more. Coming up after the break, Qatar is aiming to extend the Israel-Hamas truce once again as the first day of the two-day extension holds. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV, sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's, McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? 
If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And you are with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we're live with you from 1 until 3 every weekday afternoon. Coming up now, Hamas terrorists have refused to release the youngest hostage, instead handing 10-month-old Kafir Baibas to separate Palestinian terror groups. A Brianna Gay's murder trial continues today. The jury has heard how a plan to kill the teenager was found in the bedroom of one of the 16-year-olds accused of her murder. And a 700 quid Christmas advert by a pub in Northern Ireland has gone viral with the manager describing the reaction as beyond her wildest dreams. All that coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with Zora Sullivan. Thanks, Kev. Good afternoon, bosses. At one of the Kent hospitals where a double murderer was able to abuse dead bodies for over a decade showed a persistent lack of curiosity about what was going on at Tunbridge Wells Hospital. Maintenance worker David Fuller abused the corpses of at least 101 women and girls at Kent and Sussex and the Tunbridge Wells Hospital before his arrest in December 2020. Sir Jonathan Michael led the inquiry. Senior management of the Trust had been aware of problems with the running of the mortuary from as early as 2008. But there is little evidence that effective action was taken to remedy these issues or that the Trust Board paid any attention to the mortuary. Requests for CCTV to be installed in the mortuary were not actioned for over a decade. Had his colleagues, managers and senior leaders been more curious, it is likely that he would have had less opportunity to offend. A court said two teenagers accused of killing B Brianna Jai are blaming each other. The 16-year-old transgender girl was stabbed to death in a Wiltshire park earlier this year. Talk TV correspondent Oliver whitfield Mirjic has been following the case at Manchester Crown Court. The prosecution is continuing to set out its opening argument in which they accuse both of the defendants, Girl X and Boy Y, of plotting to murder Brianna Jai. They say that they found a planning document where there was going to be a code word which was said before both of the defendants were then going to stab Brianna in the stomach and in the back. In the day before the murder took place, Girl X is said to have messaged Boy Y that she was excited. Both of the defendants continue to deny that they played any part in the murder and continue to blame each other. More hostages will be released later as the truce between Israel and Hamas enters its fifth day. A last-minute deal meant the pause in the fighting has been extended by 48 hours, ending tomorrow. Under the new conditions, three Palestinian prisoners will be released in return for each Israeli hostage. Michael Gove has said sorry to victims and families who endured pain and loss during the pandemic. The then Duchy of Lancaster told the COVID inquiry the structure of the Cabinet Office was flawed and not appropriate to deal with the crisis. He said politicians are human beings who make mistakes and errors. But the way in which the Cabinet Office was configured was not, uh, to my mind, appropriate for the type of pandemic that we faced and indeed the type of crisis that requires an effective whole of government. 
The granddaughter of the founder of Wilco says she's devastated for letting workers down. 12,000 redundancies took place after the retailer collapsed. Lisa Wilkinson, who's Wilco's chair, told MPs they've let every one of those people down. And finally, a cold blast means slippery conditions are on the way. Walkers and cyclists are being warned to be extra careful. The Met Office says ice could cause hazards over the next three days. Expect disruptions to public transport as well. Well, that's the latest. Now with more on those icy conditions, here's Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's feeling cold out there for today and for the rest of the week due to northerly winds, but there's also plenty of sunshine to be had. Although it is a bit cloudy across parts of the southwest of England and Wales for this afternoon with one or two showers. Everywhere else it's mainly dry with plenty of sunshine, but the northeast of Scotland, as you can see, is seeing some showers that are turning wintry across the high ground there. It is going to be a cold feeling day compared to recently as well. Temperatures are up to around three to five or six degrees Celsius, slightly higher across the southwest. West. Now into tonight, it stays mostly clear and cold with a widespread frost developing again across parts of Scotland. Northern and eastern England may also see frosty conditions as well as Northern Ireland. Showers will continue across central and southeastern parts of England and there will be showers across the northeast of Scotland and northeast England and there could be icy stretches across these areas. There may also be some snow by the early hours of the morning down to some lower levels of Scotland and northeast England. Otherwise, it's a repeat performance for tomorrow. Plenty of sunshine on the cards once again, again, the far southwest of England and Wales, a bit cloudier and less cold, but uh, everywhere else, lots of sunshine. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. Lots coming up over the next hour. Oh, yeah. Have we got a treat for you? We are going to be showing you the latest amazing blockbuster video release from none other than our very own Prime Minister. That's right. During the advert break, Kevin and I were messing about on Twitter and discussing the state of his uh, production notes. I'm doodling. I'm a really... dangerous doodler. Honestly, I worry about his mental health when you look at the Byron. Yeah, you should that worry thing. about my mental health. But someone it. else's mental health I worry about is Rishi Sunak because he's put this really saccharine video up on Twitter or X um, where, you know, forget talk about stopping boats or, you know, the crisis of uh, the cost of Some living. Some aeroplane or other? Yeah, no, he's banging on about vegetable oil powered aircraft. Oh, wow. In that sort of weird sort of like, yeah. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. It's a brilliant aeroplane. It's got to. You know, vegetable oil in it. So it saves the planet. It's brilliant. It's amazing. Absolute, Vote for me. No! <laughs> my absolute favourite part of all of this is he's actually tweeted above the video, something exciting is happening in our skies. It's like, what is it? Is it a plane to Rwanda? No. Yeah. I mean, this guy's got to learn to prioritise. I mean, he seems to think that with all the other trouble that's happening to him right now, I mean, he is in a world of trouble. Uh, you know, we been discussing his uh, complete reset failure, his great reset, which turns out to be not very great because he's more than 20 pe points behind uh, Labour in the polls. Uh, so he's got all this trouble going on. He's uh, having a row with Greece. He's having a row with Joe Biden. You name it. Uh, but he has found a reason to be cheerful. Oh, yeah. It's an aeroplane that runs on corn oil. Yay. God almighty. Did See you know, that picture of him by uh, outside 10 Downing Street then? He was so small, even as he was waving, his hand didn't even graze the number on the front of the door. <laughs> <laughs> he can't help being diminutive, can he? Uh, we'll, 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 we'll give him that. He's but... a prime minister with a policy for growth. <laughs> he, he should, next time he comes out of number 10, he'll come through the letterbox. I think. <laughs> maybe just... they built him a cat flap <laughs> in the back of that. He's a small guy. <laughs> by the small. way, those trousers he wears that don't come to his ankles, uh, as a fashion designer, friends of mine, goes crazy about that. He said, it hasn't been a fashion for three years. That's Stop to, wearing your trousers he has like to buy that. Buy them from the Harrods kids section, doesn't yeah. he? Probably. <laughs> look, he doesn't even like how little he is. Uh -huh. It's like, buy me. That door makes him look even. Well, he smaller. can't help being diminutive, but no, he, can, he can't help wearing short trousers. 
Well, there you go. Well, write an urgent letter I'm... right now for his attention. You know how, how much he enjoys correspondence and applying to it swiftly. <laughs> uh, we're asking, apart from lengthening his trousers, what else does Rishi Sunak have to do to win the next election? You can call us. That's right, you can talk to us in person. 03444991000. Text us on 8722. Or if you're a bit more coy, you can tweet us on Twitter. And the handle for that is at TalkTV. Uh, on to our top story now. Uh, Qatar is aiming to extend the Israel-Hamas truce once again as the first day of the two-day extension holds. It comes as Hamas have admitted that the youngest hostage taken from Israel, 10-month-old uh, Kafir Bibas, and his family have been handed to a separate Palestinian terror group. The group is based in the southern city of Khan Yunis, which is expected to be the location of Israel's next offensive once the truce expires. Nine children, including three-year-old twins and two women, were freed on Monday. Well, joining us now is Conservative MP Colonel James Sunderland. James, are you privy to any information of who this other terror group are? Why on earth there are a network of various other gangs and organisations and nefarious individuals? I mean, I heard as well that some general Palestinian civilians got in on the act and are holding hostages. What is this network of people? I have absolutely no idea whatsoever, Alex. Um, clearly, it's indicative of a very confused part of the world. Um, tensions are running high. We've seen this bit of conflict raging now for, for, for many weeks. And uh, ultimately, uh, I'm going to praise the Qatari government, actually. Um, they've been really good over this. They are negotiating hard. Uh, they seem to have found a way to sort of um, get in between the Egyptians and the Iranians and Hamas and the Americans. And uh, I have to say that uh, what we're seeing on the news at the moment is quite positive. Uh, James, uh, it seems that uh, Hamas uh, definitely would like this truce to be extended. They like, they'd like it to carry on. A lot of cynics concluding that that means they want to refresh, get more fuel, uh, resupply their armoury, etc., etc. Uh, meanwhile, Israel, uh, it seems, does not want a truce and it will return to hostilities. Uh, as a military man... Uh, do you see that as the future? Do you think Israel will return uh, to the fighting? And uh, how long do you think this will go on for? Well, I mean, Kevin, there's so much in that. It's very hard to answer um, a set of questions like that. But what I would say to you is that uh, I've had a lot of correspondence and constituents, as all my colleagues have in recent weeks. Uh, they clearly think that the UK is somehow able to wave a magic wand and stop hostilities. We're not, um, you know, we're not directly involved. We are as much a bystander here as anybody else. But what we are doing is leaning on the Americans and leaning on the Israelis to make sure that uh, we do um, urge restraint amongst all of the uh, protagonists. Um, and also, I've got to be careful because, um, you know, my temptation is to answer the question as a military man. But, of course, I'm not anymore. I'm now a politician. Um, from the military perspective, I've no doubt at all that Hamas will be using any ceasefire to, uh, to, to re-equip and uh, and reposture its forces, um, which is not a good thing. Um, but by the same token, I, we have to make sure that we get aid into Gaza. We've got to make sure that we get hostages, as many as possible, hopefully all of them um, now released. And we've also got to make sure that, uh, that, that, that you know, we, we have to uh, avoid further loss of a civilian life in Gaza. I mean, how long, how much longer do you think political will in this country will hold? I mean, certainly for the Labour Party, they have pressure being piled on some of their MPs with up to 30 uh, independent Muslim candidates threatening to stand against Labour MPs in Muslim majority areas to try and rumble their chances at regaining their seats. I think less pressure on the Conservatives. But how much longer do you think political will will hold? And how important is it, actually, that the UK does stand firm when it comes to showing solidarity with Israel? Well, the British government has a policy, which is quite clear. Um, you have to say that uh, what the SNP did uh, with the ceasefire vote was totally irresponsible. Um, this is a time for serious politics and serious politicians. But to seek to divide the House on this issue, um, in my view, wasn't the right thing to do. It split the Labour Party, um, which is something that Keir Starmer is going to have to deal with. Um, but, but I think people are gradually sort of warming to the idea that the UK does not have a magic wand. And uh, all we can do through our excellent diplomats and foreign office is to seek to put pressure and influence on the key protagonists. And that's what we're doing. 
Uh, Jay, is one of the many crises triggered by this conflict uh, in Gaza is back here domestically. It's these, I would suggest you're talking about uh, how divisive these kind of situations tend to be. Well, uh, we have this, these divisive marches going on every weekend at cities all over the country, especially here in London, where as many as 300,000 gather to march, snake through the streets of the capital city, uh, to support Israel. Uh, and along the way, uh, I've been to three of them, I've seen what they do. They've got these banners, you know, from the river to the sea, uh, just, you know, calling for the destruction of Israel. Uh, they're anti-Semitic. These marches are full of anti-Semitic ban banners and uh, posters and chants. Uh, so far, the police have not really done anything about this. We've had entire arrest counts for an entire day of, like, nine and things like that when you've got 100,000 people on the streets, which seems incongruous. Uh, is it time for the police uh, to crack down and to stop all of this hate going on? Because these posters, these chants, these banners, they're against the law. Kevin, it's such a difficult thing to answer because, of course, we had this debate uh, with the march that took place on Armistice Day. Um, you could argue that uh, the then Home Secretary lost their job over it. Um, so this is a difficult political issue. What I would say personally is that I have no issue at all with peaceful protest across London. We have these freedoms across society which are, are very well prized and we have to look after those. But by the same token, the police know where the line is. The police know what the law is. Therefore, you have to defer to the police to make an operational decision to intervene when that law and that line is crossed. And ultimately, that's a matter for them. I'm personally quite clear that the law is clear cut in this particular case. There is work to do on war memorials. We know that. But ultimately, we have to defer to police because we police by consent and they have the powers to deal with that. We talk about lines being crossed. What are your opinions on uh, the ongoing uh, issues various people have with the BBC in the way that they're covering this particular conflict? I mean, we've had a letter written to Al Jazeera by UK-based BBC staff saying that they're too sympathetic towards Israel, that they're not humanising uh, what's happening to victims <laughs> in Gaza and saying that they're afraid of reprisals if they give their names and speak out. We've then learnt today that, um, uh, have I got news for you, at a time when the news is being dominated, by what's going on in the Middle East is being hosted by a guy called Gus Khan who has put out various tweets calling Israel genocidal and the like. Um, I mean, the BBC represents, in many respects, the voice of Britain around the world. Is that something that you and your party are concerned about? Yes, we are. Let's be clear, the BBC is not a political organisation. The BBC is a public service broadcaster and it has a clear remit to report in a balanced and fair manner. I think we've seen, and the BBC has apologised for the way it reported initially after the atrocities on the 7th of October, uh, but even now it refers to Hamas as an organisation that many uh, believe to be terrorist. It's not. It's a prescribed terrorist organisation fact. What we have to make sure is that the BBC also uh, reports impartially as the conflict carries on. And what I mean by that is this. Um, of course, when you've got embedded journalists in Gaza, when you've got people who are there on a daily basis reporting what's happening, it's not easy. It's not easy to draw that dispassionate line between emotion and between reporting factually. Um, so I am, you know, I'm a believer in the BBC. I have faith in the BBC. Um, I, I do not believe that BBC uh, employees or those working for the BBC in any form should be retweeting uh, material on this. I think ultimately the BBC needs to get on with its job and let politicians do this. Yeah, thank you ever so much. Conservative MP Colonel James Sunderland. Well, joining us now is Frank Ledwidge, a military intelligence officer who served in Iraq and Afghanistan and author of Losing Small Wars and Investment in Blood. Thanks so much for being with us, Frank. Let's go back to the main story today, which is about hostages and the release of hostages and the fact that this 10-month-old baby, the youngest hostage snatched from his family home, is now being held, we're, led to believe, be led, uh, we're being led to believe, in Khan Yunus, used as a human shield to stop uh, Israel from uh, going into Khan Yunus in the south, but it's being held by some organisation other than Hamas. Uh, what is the complexity of all of this? Who, who might this other organisation be? Why is he in their hands? Do you have any idea? Well, uh, Alex, we can speculate. So this little boy, Kvir, and his four-year-old brother, Ariel, were traded probably, I would suggest, by Hamas with this other group. We could speculate which group it is. I'm happy to do that. 
perhaps Palestinian Islamic Jihad might have something to, to say about it. But we saw this kind of thing going on a lot in Syria during the Islamic State days of the civil war with these uh, groups of terrorists trading hostages around. Now, clearly two children are worth a lot. So I'm speculating here, but I would think that that might be expressed in terms of money or weapons, or indeed the prospect of getting whatever this group is, getting their prisoners out in the next or in indeed in the current uh, hostage deal with the, um, with the Palestinians, prisoners for hostages. Three to one, let's not forget. May well be that they figure that two very small children are worth more than three, or indeed are worth three of theirs rather than Hamas's, or whatever Hamas faction it was that they were dealing with. All speculation, but look, look, it's the pattern of these Islamist groups and group of skills to trade with each other, the horse trade, uh, human beings. Uh, we know that happens, and it's happening here. Uh, Frank, uh, <clears throat> ostensibly, uh, Hamas, you know, they've got time on their hands now, uh, and uh, a lot of people say, well, the reason they wanted a truce was to regroup, refresh, get fuel, uh, get more weapons, and be ready. Uh, to resume the fight. Uh, meanwhile, we know that Israel uh, wants to return to hostilities uh, as soon as it can get as many hostages out as possible at this point. Obviously, in the end, it wants to get them all out. Uh, but uh, what I'm saying to you is, uh, when we have this current exchange of uh, hostages and prisoners complete, would you uh, predict a, a full return to hostilities? And if so, what kind of time frame would you put on that? There are big political pressures, obviously, in Israel also to continue this ceasefire because it's felt that there may be yet another tranche. And the words coming out of Qatar now, the Mossad chief is there as we speak, are that uh, Hamas says that it's looking for some more people who meet the criteria. So it may well be that it goes beyond tomorrow, uh, th this current uh, ceasefire. But to come back to your question, Kevin, uh, yes, what we will see is an immediate resumption at the same rate as before, perhaps even much more effective, because whilst you're right that Hamas needs time to reset, it's been ravaged, of course, by recent campaign or this section of it. But let's not forget that also this, to some extent, suits the Israeli armed forces to the extent that they can reset for the next phase. They can take advantage of new human intelligence. They can take advantage of other forms of uh, surveillance that's going on as we speak. And of course, the priority there will be to try and rescue hostages. There are still dozens and dozens left. Um, really, the rubber will hit the road with respect to negotiations when we move beyond the current criteria, which is women and children, into the men. But we're nowhere near that yet. But anyway, yes, we will see a resumption. Netanyahu's made it very clear. There's no doubt at all that the IDF's ready. We'll see a resumption at the same rate as before. And let's not forget, by the way, the campaign hasn't finished in northern Gaza yet. It's barely, well, I wouldn't say it's barely started, but it's probably about halfway through. The IDF hasn't yet taken that part of the of the strip, but they will. And once they finish that, they'll assess the next stage. As a former military intelligence officer, having served in Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, what we do know about things that happen in the Middle East is they tend to be products of a wider regional proxy war. And the role that countries such as Qatar and Egypt are playing in all of this are quite fascinating, really. Do you have any insights into, essentially, who are the foes, who are our friends, who we can trust, and quite what is going on when it comes to countries like Qatar, who are being interlocutors? Yes, I don't, I don't think we've got any friends. Uh, we have people that uh, that our side, if you if we can call it that, can work with, and certainly the Egyptians, with respect to Hamas, are such a are such a country. You have to remember, I think, that the Egyptian government has absolutely no time for Hamas. Hamas is an offshoot of the toxic Mo Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the current government in Egypt, of course, displaced the Muslim Brotherhood government, and has. Uh, essentially is fighting a low-level war against them in their own country. It's a very vicious insurgency, or was until recently, going on in the Sinai itself. But the corollary of that is that Egypt has good intelligence connections in Gaza, and we're seeing them used now. Qatar is a very interesting uh, country, of course, and as Mr Sutherland said there before, uh, we do have, or hinted, we do have close ties with them. We share a fighter squadron, for example, 
And certainly they have been seen as, and I think to some extent rightly, as honest brokers. The other interesting factor is they've got pretty good relationships with Iran as well, which got them into trouble with the Saudis some years ago. And concerning the wider conflict, we did get some good news in the last couple of days, actually, pertains particularly to Hezbollah. And that is that the uh, Iranians gave a pretty blunt message to Hamas that they weren't going to come in on their side on the basis that A, they weren't ready, and B, you didn't tell us what you were going to do. So I think we're pretty much, I won't say safe, but I would conjecture for the next few weeks, we won't see Iranian involvement. And that's really important from the Lebanese perspective, because Hezbollah is, is, a, is a proxy, essentially, of the Iranians. The other uh, ace in the Arab Islamist hand, of course, are the Houthis, who've been flinging drones at the Israelis for some time. They hijacked a ship and stole a ship, actually, the other day. Uh, and they, they will be causing trouble. But concerning the Hezbollah axis, which was the one the, re the Israelis were really concerned about, there will be low-level conflict on that border for some time, but Iran won't be getting involved, uh, at least in the immediate term. It's absolutely fascinating stuff. I'm, I think all these proxy wars and the wider geopolitics is uh, absolutely astonishing. Thank you so much, uh, Frank Ledwidge, for shining a bit of light on uh, the complexities of what is going on in the region. Now, coming up after the break, the Brianna J murder trial continues as jurors hear how plans to kill her were found in the bedroom of one of those accused of her murder. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, moving on to another story today and the murder trial of Brianna Jai has continued after the jury heard traumatic details of her death yesterday. The prosecution told the court that a plan to kill the trans teenager was found in the bedroom of one of the 16-year-olds accused of her murder. Well, Talk TV's correspondent Oliver Whitfield Mircic is outside Manchester Crown Court for us. Oliver, I mean, it's very disturbing and upsetting the details that we have uh, been learning. What has been said in court today? Yes, that's right, Alex. And just a warning to viewers, some of the things that we're going to speak about today, again, will be disturbing. Well, we've heard in court today about a planning note that was found inside the bedroom of Girl X. Remember, both of the defendants, Girl X and Boy Y, we cannot name them for legal reasons. But in this planning note, it was said that the plan was for her to say a code word and then Boy Y was going to stab Brianna, the 16-year-old transgender teenager, in the back while Girl X stabbed her in the stomach. The plan was then for the body to be moved somewhere else in the park and it would be covered in logs. But that plan, according to the prosecution, was disrupted by the appearance of two dog walkers. Now, they thought they were just walking towards another couple who were tending to their dog. But as they approached, Girl X and Boy Y ran off into a nearby field. The prosecution says that they were then spotted on CCTV walking calmly through the nearby town. Four days later, Brianna's blood-soaked mobile phone was found hidden in a drain. Now, when the two teens who are accused of this murder were taken into the police station for questioning, that's where their stories diverged. Girl X said that she had met Brianna with Boy Y and they'd gone to the park and they were sitting down having some conversations on that park bench. She says at that point, Brianna received a text message from a 17-year-old lad in Manchester who said that they wanted to meet up and so she had to leave. However, it seems that in that police interview with Boy Y, he decided to change his story. And he said that while they were sitting on the bench, he had gone to a nearby tree to use the toilet. And when he turned back, it was at that point that he saw Girl X stabbing Brianna multiple times. He rushed over to check whether Brianna was OK. And when he reached down to touch her, he then got blood on his hands. It was at that point, he says, that Girl X ran away and he, in a panic, followed suit. The prosecution says that both of the defendants are lying, that they've been lying the whole time up until the point that they were confronted at interview and that is when the stories have changed. Important to note that so far, both of the defendants say that they did not commit the act of murder. <coughs> Instead, they are trying to blame each other. And today we're going to be hearing from more witnesses, Ollie. Yes, that's right. So now that the opening argument from the prosecution is out of the way, we're now going to hear from witnesses. We're going to have police officers who come and give evidence. Also expected to testify is Brianna's mum. Remember that after she died, Brianna's mum set up a campaign in order to teach mindfulness to young people in schools right across the northwest of England in a way to help people cope with their mental health and to develop coping strategies. We've seen Brianna's parents in court over the p past two days, and this must be a really difficult thing for them to have to listen through. The testimony that we've heard about Brianna's body being found with 28 stab wounds to the neck, head, chest and back, the details in which the prosecution is alleging that Girl X and Boy Y have carried out the plotting to kill not only Brianna but another list of school children from the local area for any parent to listen to. It must be absolutely agony. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, now, moving on, and uh, Rishi Sunak's hopes of a Tory revival fuelled by tax cuts is floundering as a new poll shows Labour has extended its lead over the Conservatives. Well, seemingly undeterred by Sir Keir Starmer's 20-point lead, the Prime Minister has spent the day, yep, starting diplomatic fights with the Greeks <laughs> and hailing a new eco-flight over the Atlantic. Right now, something very exciting is happening in the sky above us. 
It all started with a government competition to support the industry to achieve the first net zero transatlantic flight on an aircraft using 100% sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF. Our government made up to a million pounds of funding available to support the project, and right now it's taking off. Today's Virgin Atlantic flight to New York will be entirely fueled by SAF, made primarily from waste oils and fats. Not only will SAF be key in decarbonizing aviation, but it could create a UK industry with an annual turnover of almost two and a half billion pounds, which could support over 5,000 UK jobs. It's great that British businesses and institutions like Virgin Atlantic, Rolls-Royce, Boeing and Sheffield University continue to raise the bar in aviation. Now that is blue sky thinking. Oh my God, make it stop. Rishi, no one cares about that plane unless there are migrants on it going to Rwanda. What are you doing, son? Uh, indeed. Uh, Saf, eh? Uh, what, Saf, what, what planet Saf, is nah. that guy on? I mean, it's all right, OK, it's a nice aeroplane, but uh, does he think people are going to go, oh, that, that, I've seen, just seen that Saf aeroplane. I'll vote oh, Rishi now. That's it, yeah. Anyway, joining us now in the studio is Charlie Rowley, a former Tory advisor, who's no doubt scratching his head and wondering what he would advise the <laughs> Prime Minister to do right now. Uh, I bet you wouldn't <laughs> be saying make a video about aeroplanes that run on old vegetable oil, would you? Well, I, I don't think it's a bad thing at all, actually. I have to say, I think, you know, the you idea... Oh, my gosh, right come on, Charlie, now. Now. The, the, <laughs> the, Well, the, you know, £2 billion pounds worth of investment, 5,000 jobs, that's no bad thing if for you the UK. That. And, you know, and his presentation, he should be... Give him a job on QVC or something. <laughs> I mean, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but he is all over the place, isn't he? I mean, he's 20... Put, he's had the, so many resets in the last month, we've lost count. Uh, uh, he set the party on a course of with a party of change. Well, I think that's a fundamental mistake. Nobody is actually going to believe that a party that's been in power for 13 years is the party of change. Uh, that's not to say they don't have their merits, but uh, I think this was a wrong course of action to say we are the party of change. They can't be. I, th I think that's um, uh, a fair point because I think you know that was the central theme of the conference speech that took place in October. We haven't had too much of it since, so I think that might have been quietly parked and it's now getting back to the long-term decisions that the government need to take in order to um, get the country back up and running post uh, uh, COVID and um, and so uh, I think you know and getting back to tax cuts that you talked about dealing with the migration crisis dealing with the backlog in the NHS dealing with things that really matter to people right across the country everyone knows who's uh, worked in politics all politicians and especially the prime minister has the grid and this is basically the media planning diary a month to a view at the very least where you sort of figure out strategically what you're going to talk about and where you're going to go and who you're going to give interviews and so on and so forth did you think that anywhere on anybody's grid was the idea of picking a fight with greece uh no, I don't think. I mean, I think uh, I think it would have been on the grid to have the meeting. Obviously, it would have been well, to have a meeting and have a and the, straight off the grid. <laughs> yeah. if you want but my advice. but uh, um, I think look, this this story is uh, um, uh, remarkable. I mean, this will be tomorrow's you know kebab paper. I think yeah. you know as opposed to chip paper because uh, it is so bizarre. Uh, I don't know why it's taking up so much airtime. You know, there was clearly a, a meeting that was due to take place between the Greek Prime Minister and the UK Prime Minister to talk about lots of things: the economy, migration, and maybe talk about uh, these marbles in the. Uh, in, in the in the uh, the margins, um, but there was an agreement. I understand that the, you know that there was not going to be a public uh, row over this. And then, of course, on Sunday afternoon, yeah. the Greek Prime Minister went on uh, British uh, uh, national television to uh, describe the situation as tearing up uh, something equivalent of tearing up uh, the Mona Lisa, which I think was quite sort of you know overly dramatic, if I, if I can say. And so, uh, of course, that's irritated Number Ten. And the, you know, the Prime Minister's got a, hu a huge intray. He's got too many other things to be dealing with. Um, than, than some Greek Prime Minister that, that's banging on about but marbles. He, but he's <laughs> turned it, Charlie, into an issue by cancelling the meeting. Right. I would have suggested that a better course of action would have been to receive the uh, Greek Prime Minister and tell him, well, you're not getting the marbles back in, in private in Number 10 Downing Street. Uh, Rishi has turned this into a hill to die on. Uh, <laughs> and what a strange hill that is to die on. I mean, we're always looking... I think he senses, this would be my theory, that he senses that we want this guy to, sh to show a bit of toughness, a bit of resolve. So he's looking for an issue and he's chosen the Elgin marbles and as I keep saying, uh, no disrespect to 
most of Brits, uh, but a lot of people don't even know what the Elgin marbles are. Mm. Still less do they care. So what a strange issue uh, for Rishi to pick to prove what a strong character he is. It's the wrong issue, isn't it? Well, I think it's probably why he's cancelled the meeting and, uh, you know, the, the, the Greek... I mean, look, you know, we've got lots of great ties with Greek... Uh, with Greece and uh, uh, the Greek people and... Uh, Huge time, great, great contributions that they make, and uh, it, it, it's all wonderful. But, uh, you know, the intrigue that the Prime Minister has is so vast. Uh, if you're going to waste time uh, listening to somebody bang on uh, about the marbles, when we could be talking about immigration, when you could be talking about the economy, when you could be talking about growing both uh, countries and working closer together, if that's what they both want to do, which I think it is, um, then, of course, it's a complete waste of time of the UK Prime Minister. Well, I'll take, and I'll he, take and your he, point and, there, And he's done the right thing to send him back. He should have turned meeting. up to the meeting, right? And then I can't imagine, the, turned it into I imagine an the Greek Prime Minister wanted to only talk about the marbles. I'm pretty sure if he's flown all the way over here for a sort of state visit or whatever it is, not a a state visit, but I don't know, glad hand with the Tory party, that he probably wanted to talk about a number of things, like the migrant crisis as well. And Sunak's just gone, you don't to show me respect. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> what is but, that? That's, is that, that your Rishi sort of Sunak accent? <laughs> 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 oh, I see, that was the, that was the Greek the Prime Minister. <laughs> no, no, that was Rishi trying to be like a... Oh. Gangster. How does he go again? You're I'm not doing it again. Here. It was Your rubbish. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing it again. Of course, he was Make offered a meeting. Stop. He was just, just ignore the Rishi <laughs> Sunak impression and do continue. <laughs> well, he was offered a meeting with the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden, which I know might be seen. Obviously, you want Prime Minister to meet Prime Minister, but Oliver Dowden, you must remember, was the former Culture Secretary. Yeah, who will know all a you know, lot more about the British Museum than probably uh, than what Rishi Sunak does. I would argue. Um, uh, uh, and that's not a, a slight on the Prime Minister, because he's got 101 other things to be on top of. So um, the idea that that whole meeting was rejected, I just think is uh, uh, just... Uh, it's, a, it's a PR, something that's gone wrong. I'm sure they'll make it up over the phone and they'll be meeting again uh, very soon. As, as I was saying to you earlier, Charlie, if you were still uh, in power, as it were, advising these politicians, anything that involves the word marbles, be very, very careful, <laughs> because the headlines <laughs> the, the following day will be to do with you losing them. Yes. Uh, it's pretty obvious. And something they, they often lose their marbles over is the ECHR. How many mm. times do we hear this going back about 20 years now? We're going to leave it. No, we're not. Yes, we are. Uh, turns out that uh, 40 Tory MPs may rebel by backing an American to override the ECHR. Um, but it turns out, however, that James Cleverly likes it, David Cameron. I mean, what is going on here? Can't they just decide? So I think there's, there's, there's so much within that because it's about the... Uh, it goes back to 2016. The whole point of Brexit was to take back control, take back control of the UK's borders, our money and our laws. And it seems to me that the UK government has passed a number of laws now. It has um, set up the Rwanda scheme. Uh, that is UK sovereign law that is being blocked by an international convention. Now, how you deal with that, uh, I think, is twofold. You can either go down the path that, as you were saying, Alex, that you know, a number of Tory MPs just want us to pull out of the EHCR, or you can actually work, I think, which might be more productive, which I think is where James Cleverley and certainly David Cameron, the new Foreign Secretary, wants to be uh, in this place, is to work with the international community mm -hmm. to change the EHCR but we because heard this about you know we heard this about we should stay inside the EU to reform it and yet previous Home Secretaries Theresa May said she'd leave the ECHR and set up a British Bill of Rights that was in the Cameron government he now seems to like mm. the ECHR I mean you know just do something about it already it's not not a talking shop it's actual law in this country and I and I think that's absolutely right that's a sentiment that lots of people hold but I think when you're hearing even Germany are considering sort of a Rwanda style policy when there are other European countries that are looking to the UK to say okay, Okay, if they're trying it, maybe we can do it. Because the migration crisis is not sole, uh, you know, solely a UK problem. It's happening right across mainland Europe. So I think there are other leaders in uh, in the same place as we are. Maybe the Greek get, Prime Minister. Perhaps, we, we <laughs> might just well, we'll never know. We've just lost him. <laughs> 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 he's, he's, uh, maybe he's on that um, uh, biofuel bio flight <laughs> back, <laughs> to back, back to Athens. Back to Athens. With no marbles. <laughs> oh. yeah, he's on his Matt Solar fueled plane on his way back to Athens as we speak, fuming, fuming about the Elgin marbles, aren't we all? We're furious. <laughs> oh, honestly, it's off. Charlie, thank you ever so much. I mean, that, you. you tolerate us, I don't know how. Uh, we, we've definitely lost Anytime. our marbles. Well, you're well today, out of that's Westminster for sure. anyway. In our coffee. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much. We have more of your texts and tweets coming in this lunchtime all about the future of the Tories. Martin says the Conservatives could still win the next election, really, if they scrapped the net zero environmental rubbish and committed to net zero immigration. 
But Amanda thinks there's nothing Sunak can do to win the next election as no one believes a word he says. It is the end of the Tory party until a leader with backbone can be found. Backbone, didn't you see him with the Elgin marbles? He was absolutely... Tough talking. ...iron resolve. And Howard <laughs> says, as a long-time Tory voter and party member, there is no way I can vote Tory at the next election. Throwing away an 80-plus majority due to internal infighting is scandalous. Throwing tax gimmicks at us now is too little too late. Labour will win the next general election, and so I am looking at the one after. My message to Rishi is that you cannot be trusted so just go and go now uh, and we also have a caller on the line hey. and that is chris in hereford uh, thanks for joining us chris what would you like to say well uh, this is about uh, rishi sunak winning the next general election yeah. well to be honest he hasn't got a help, hope in hell's chance of winning the next general election because i think uh, they should go back to the conservatism they should earlier uh, they've lost all the like it's, it's not the conservative party anymore uh, yeah, yeah, really. do, do you know, I want to I throw this back to Charlie, because what is the Conservative Party? They don't seem to know themselves. You've got the new Conservatives, you've got the ERG, you've got the One Nation Tories. And I went to Conservative Conference to one sort of gala dinner where they said, we're the heart of the Conservative Party, we're going to take back control of the Conservative Party. Simultaneously, another big dinner happening in another part of Manchester where they're saying exactly the opposite. We've got to get rid of these weird sort of backbench right-wing types. So he has a point, doesn't he? It's got to go back to something, at least small-c Conservatism. Well, you listed a number of um, groups there and um, factions within the Conservative Party, which demonstrates that it's a broad church and a party for everybody. You know, there is something for everybody within the Conservative Party. And I think, look, you know, doing the things that um, uh, your caller was just talking about, cutting taxes, getting on top of uh, the immigration crisis that we have in this country, growing the economy, uh, and making sure that the NHS is fit for purpose, making sure that actually people feel the pound in their pocket again, that the country is levelled up, that it's benefited in areas where it didn't benefit under Labour. And I know that people will want to uh, just look at the 20-point lead that Labour have, but I would ask people to just to look at the other polls that take place that show that the vast majority of people are still undecided because of the lack of policy that is coming forward from the Labour Party. And I think when it comes to an election which focuses people's minds, there will be a real choice to either, yes, carry on with uh, Rishi Sunak, who Party is, who is, who is, who is <laughs> cutting mean, tax and doing all Charlie, the conservative know, things that people want. You're not working for them oh, anymore. Oh, 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 risk. Risk. Charlie, I know you are up early. <laughs> nice try, show, but, but no think, cigar. Yeah, the, the, the delirium is beginning to set <laughs> in. I've been up for a few hours now, so... We've oh, all lost well. our marbles. <laughs> I wonder if that's convinced Kristen Hereford. Now, coming up after the break, a 700-quid Christmas advert by a pub in Northern Ireland has gone viral, rivalling the likes of m and and John Lewis. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV, sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, I'm just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational discussion You can't, discussion can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the manager of a pub in Northern Ireland has described the reaction to its Christmas advert as, and I quote, beyond her wildest dreams after it went Guys, oh, Now, that video was released by Charlie's Bar in Enniskillen, and it's racked up millions of views online. And guess what? It only cost 700 quid to make. That's right. That's compared to the likes of John Lewis and Marks and Spencer, who are thought to have forked out up to £7 million on their Christmas adverts. Uh, joining us now is uh, PR expert Mark Borkowski. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, now, uh, I've seen all of these uh, Christmas uh, videos, uh, uh, these adverts, and there's no doubt whatsoever that Charlie's Bar in Inniskilling wins the competition, the Chris Christmas competition, by a mile, proving that a good story is much better than millions of pounds wasted on production values. Uh, that's the point. This is a great story, well told, for just 700 quid. Yeah, indeed. Uh, indeed, it's a, it's a great commercial, and I think that what we've seen is that there is the ingredients um, for the Christmas commercials most of these retailers put out. Um, and I don't think it takes uh, anybody's done a degree in advertising, you know, to understand what those are. And I think this is touching. Um, it's got a great piece of music. Uh, I do question there the grave. It's a very, very big grave. So there's been obviously a huge family tragedy to bury all those uh, people there. Um, but it it, 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 it subliminally actually talks to us about one of the great things about Christmas that we, we seem to ignore, the important things about loneliness and age. Yeah. Um, I think that it's tapped into all those sort of things. It's engineered itself, and it shows you don't have to have massive production values. Thousands of successful people on TikTok and YouTube will tell you that. You don't have to have crowds of um, you know editors and, 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 and cameramen to with multi-shots to deliver it, as long as you are reaching down into, into emotion, telling a great story, as you say. And this is, this is what it does, and, and, and hats off. Um, to that tiny little pub and maybe they'd be full of Guinness drinkers all over Christmas. Oh, let's hope so. I mean, I like to believe that this is just one of those beautiful things that goes viral on social media because someone says, have a look at this. I've seen this. Isn't it wonderful? And it gets retweeted and retweeted, whatever you call it, on TikTok. We talked. Um, <laughs> but, you know, John Lewis have waded in, haven't they, and decided to sort of jump on the bandwagon with their sort of infamous line of, uh, we're not crying, you are. That's fairly PR savvy, though, isn't it, by John Lewis, to see the success of this and try and take a bit of its glory well everybody will be doing that that's a, that's every smart publicist every smart marketeer will be looking at this and saying look this has captured uh, the conversation um everybody's talking about it we want to be part of that and that's that's what people are doing so expect to see loads of spoof ads um, I suspect that most of the characters in this in this commercial, particularly uh, the old man, will become stars overnight. And, uh, you know, it, it's going to be a thing of legend because 
we like the idea that the professionals would be gazumped by some very smart sort of amateurs who have actually, you know, tacked on and actually taken their own game and beaten them at it. And we like the underdog, and there's a there's a there's a smell of the underdog uh, as well as the as the dog there um, on this commercial that 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 we want to applaud. And you're right, you know, if something is good, that's exactly what we do. Do you know we what I'd be share. doing, Mark? Well, I'd be doing, if I was working for John Lewis or Marks and Spencers next year, I'd be going, you know, uh, how about, uh, you know that 700 quid advert last Christmas? Uh, why don't we replicate that? Let's not spend 7, 10 million quid on some kind of Venus flytrap saga. Uh, do you, do you fly think, trap. Do you think that they, next year, that the big stores will be thinking simple, not expensive? Well, do you know what? Simplicity is very difficult to replicate. Yeah. I mean, this has captured a moment in time. And I think that um, it, 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 is a, it, is a, it is a mark of genius. It's the simplicity of it. People look at, you know, a Damien Hirst spin painting and say, well, I can do that. Well, you don't. And you didn't. And it has its moment in time and it flourishes. I, I, you know, I think that everybody would be explaining to John Lewis and all their clients why it's impossible to achieve that with 700 quid. Because, you know, there's a lot riding on those commercials, a big spend, um, and therefore you've got to get it right. And um, and I think that the, the scale of those juggernauts wouldn't suit something like this. You know, we'd be complaining about the production values and can't they do something more than that so there are there's a burdensome responsibility of producing those ads where a little pub in a skillin can get away with it uh, yeah i'd imagine as well as being 700 quid versus 7 million quid that that probably took a couple of days to film and lord knows how long it takes to film these big sort of blockbuster ones they did that in a couple of hours trust me uh and it finishes <laughs> with that wb yates quote lovely quote, oh, uh, a lovely quote which is uh, there's no such thing as strange as just friends who you have yet to meet which is a rather lovely sentiment for this time that of is, year and it's think? all about pubs isn't it and what pubs are there for it's a meeting place of like-minded bringing the community together Should here's, we here's the pub definitely it's 100 pub. yeah. that's, that's all that's that came yeah we've got to get that <laughs> drink in mark good to talk to you mate uh, sadly alex i do believe we may have come to the end of the show well that just means thank it's pub o'clock doesn't it it does thank you for tuning in please do join us same time tomorrow up next of course though is ian collins so do stay tuned to talk tv but meanwhile have a very good afternoon a lovely evening and a joyful night Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. <laughs> For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV, sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. 
Rishi Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking.